hi to all of you. I'm happy to have you here. I, I'm here in California where it's a beautiful sunny day. I hope you're all having good weather too. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you for a while, probably really fast. So after we're done here, if you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint I'm gonna show you, please email me and I'll be happy to send it to you. My students always complain that I talk too fast. So, um, so I'll try to slow down a little bit and I'll also try to have some time for questions too. But what we're gonna to do today is talk about um, criminal justice for authors. So I'm gonna go ahead and start my PowerPoint. There we go. Um, so first of all, just a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Kim Fielding, and I have I have two selves. Um, the Kim Fielding self is an author. I've written see my thirtieth novel just got published last month, so I've I've written a lot of books, um, primarily gay romance um, with a lot of spec fic in there, and I've also been dabbling more recently in science fiction and in horror. So. The Kim side of me does that. Um, my day job is I'm a criminal justice professor. I've been doing that for thousands of years. Um, I have my background is I have a law degree and I have a PhD in psychology. So that's how I ended up teaching criminal justice. So every now and then I like to kind of bring those two halves of myself together. Um, and um, that's what we're doing today. So what I'm going to be doing is talking about um, giving sort of a real crash course on some aspects of the American criminal justice system. And um, in particular, I'm going to be focusing on things that authors often get wrong. Um, because I don't know how you guys feel about it, but if I'm reading a book and it happens a lot, I'm reading a book and there's an error in this stuff, it just pulls me right out of it. So um, I'm going to be focusing on those with some pictures of me enjoying torture implements because that's what happens when they let me play in the castles. Um, so what I'm going to say to you a lot is don't pay attention to what you see on TV. Everybody thinks they know something about criminal justice because they've watched, you know, 20 episodes of CSI or something like that. Um, it's not accurate. So ignore television. Um, fortunately, it's not all that hard to do some research and find out what the reality is. So one of the things I'm going to tell you repeatedly is whatever jurisdiction, assuming you're setting your story in a real jurisdiction, remember to check your jurisdiction's rules and policies. And the good news I can tell you about that is usually if you can't find the information online, people in the agencies are pretty willing to talk to you. It's their job, they like talking about that stuff. And they're flattered when somebody says, hey, I'm an author and I wanna know, and they want you to get it right too. So remember to check what's, what's going on in your jurisdiction. Now, since this is a spec fic, Con, you may be asking, well, what if you are not in the United States or the United States as, as we know it? You know, if you're writing paranormal, you may very well be dealing with the criminal justice system exactly as it really exists. But if you're writing sci-fi or fantasy or something else, um, you may be, you have a lot of room to play, but that doesn't mean you necessarily wanna ignore um, the criminal justice system. You can use it as a basis um, it'll keep you from sort of reinventing the wheel. It'll make your system feel more grounded. And of course, if your system originated in the United States some way or another, it'll help you that way. So you can use um, the system as it exists as a, as a starting point to play with. And there was my, my very handsome and, um, and capable guide from Iceland. He wasn't really in a, a time traveling Viking, but he was willing to, to pose with my little vampire spike. So. I told him I'm going to put them in a novel and he's all in favor of it. So. Um, so one of the issues when we're dealing with the American criminal justice system, one of the prob probably the major issue has to do with jurisdiction. And this is important because our system is what's called fragmented, which means we don't have just one single criminal justice system. We've got it at lots of different levels. So criminal justice aspects can exist at the city level, the county level, the state level, the federal level, and the international level. And they don't all do things the same way. And sometimes they conflict, sometimes they cooperate. Um, so that's something that's fairly unique about the American criminal justice system. If you're writing about um, England, Canada, Australia, or any other former English colonies, some of this is gonna apply as well, but not all of it. So um, again, do your, do your research. Um, 
to give an idea how fragmented we are, there are 18,000 individual law enforcement agencies in the United States, and every one of them does things differently. You can have two police departments that are in towns right next to each other with totally different ways of doing things. Um, so that's a lot. Then we've got 51 different court systems, 1,800 state and federal prisons, and 3,200 local jails. So it's a lot. And that's why I'm going to continually urge you to, to check what's going on locally. So I like to divide the criminal justice system up into components that I'll begin with the letter C so we can all help remember them. The first is codes, which is laws. So this is where we're talking about um, local ordinances, uh, state laws, it could be county things, it could be federal laws um, and so forth. So that's codes and it also includes the constitution. The second C is cops. That one's pretty self-explanatory. The third is courts. And then the final is corrections, which is everything we do to someone after they've been convicted of a crime. And I'm gonna talk about some stuff within each of these components as we go. So again, remember to check your jurisdiction. So we'll begin with codes. Um, one thing people often get wrong is dealing with homicide. We're writers, we like to kill people off and that's a lot of fun. But if we're gonna be killing people, I, I tell people it's my therapy. You know, I have a meeting at work and I wanna, I want to murder people, so I do. Um, so anytime you've got somebody dying, it's homicide. But there's lots of different kinds of homicide. And it's important if you're going to be dealing with it to understand the different kinds. The action that's involved is the same for every single kind of homicide. A human being has died. Now, notice how I put some things in red. Those are the things you should maybe pay the most attention to. Because if you're a specific writer, you get to play with what we mean by human being. The law is just starting to think about what that means at the moment. In the past, when they thought about it, it's like, well, when does somebody start becoming a human being at birth or earlier in a pregnancy? When do they stop becoming a human being? You know, when does somebody die? But now we've got questions about, well, what if, if some, what if we're talking about artificial intelligence? Um, if you're writing spec fic, what if we're talking about something that's pretty human-like, um, but not quite a human, you know, a werewolf or an alien or something like that. So that's something you can play with. And that could be a plot point right there is trying to decide, you know, is that homicide if you, if you kill a really smart computer or something like that. Um, in general, um, we divide homicides up into two categories, murder and manslaughter and jurisdictions vary about this, but, but in each one of these is also divided. The action is always gonna be the same for any kind of homicide. It's always gonna be killing a human being. The difference between them is what's going on in the offender's mind and especially um, their intent. Did they think, did they plan it ahead of time? Um, was it sort of a spur of the moment thing while they got in a fight? Was it a real, a, was, were they being reckless? Were they being careless? Um, and those are gonna determine which kind of homicide it is. And it makes a really big difference because for first degree murder in some jurisdictions, you can get the death penalty. Whereas for involuntary manslaughter, you might just get probation for a very short prison time. So what's going on in that person's head is really important. And that's, that's what's gonna distinguish different kinds of homicide. One of the things that you see that, that uh, Catherine Dare drew my plot bunny for me. So anytime you see that plot bunny showing up there on the right, that's where I'm pointing out that this might be a particularly interesting thing for you to play with in your stories. Um, one of them is the concept of felony murder. If someone is committing a felony and somebody dies during the commission of that felony, that that offender is liable for first degree murder. And that's really interesting because they don't actually have to kill anyone. They don't even have to intent, want anybody dead. For example, suppose their partner is the one who gets killed. Police come and they shoot their partner uh, dead. The, the, the co-offender there is still guilty for first degree murder. If they're the getaway driver, still first degree murder. If they go in with a fake gun and the victim you know, has a heart attack and drops dead, it's still first degree murder. So that's really something interesting you can play with. I always think that's good if you want um, a character who has doing really hard time for something really bad, and yet you want that character really sympathetic, this is a good way to do it. Because they've done something really bad, but they haven't really killed anyone, and yet they're doing really hard time. Another thing people 
very frequently get wrong is the different kinds of theft. Um, and the three major kinds of theft are robbery, burglary, and larceny. And um, robbery is when you take property through force or threats of force. I hear people say all the time, oh, my, my house was robbed or my car got robbed last night. You can't rob a house and you can't rob a car. You can only rob people because the important aspect of robbery is that is, is force or threats of force. So if you, know, if you hold up a gun and say, um, you know, give me all your money or I'll shoot you, that's robbery. But if you break into somebody's house when they're not home, that's not robbery. And robbery is classified as a, a violent offense. Um, it's a more serious offense and people get more um, serious uh, prison time for that. Burglary is entering a place with intent to commit a felony. So if you break into somebody's house or car or store um, with intent to steal something or commit any other felony, that's burglary. And then larceny is taking property without force. So um, you, um, somebody drops their wallet and you pick it up and take it home with you, that's larceny. I mean, you haven't threatened anybody, you didn't break into their property, but you took something that you knew wasn't, their, wasn't yours, that's larceny. Um, and so each of these is treated differently by the legal system. Robbery is the most serious offense. A person can be convicted of both burglary and larceny. So if I, um, if I break into somebody's house and then while I'm in the house, I steal their computer, I could be convicted of burglary for the breaking part and of larceny for the stealing part. Another thing I see people often get wrong is re with regards to juvenile offenses. And this varies even more from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, in part because the juvenile justice system is new. Um, our current juvenile justice system was created right around the year 1900. So compared to the rest of the CJ system, it's new. Um, and so it varies a lot from place to place. One of the things that's important is just because someone's under 18 doesn't mean they're gonna be treated as a, a juvenile by the criminal justice system. In some states, people can be tried as adults as young as 10. And we don't see that happen very often, but it can happen. Um, and how that happens and when it can happen can vary a lot from state to state. It can, um, different kinds of crimes, that kind of thing. In some states, juvenile offenses can even count towards three strikes. So if you have a character who has committed juvenile offenses, don't discount them as being unimportant because those may come back to haunt them later in life, which again could be an interesting plot point. Um, and another thing people think that uh, once somebody hits 18 that their juvenile record gets sealed in many states, that's not the case. So if somebody um, committed juvenile offenses and was adjudicated delin delinquent, those offenses may be fully available for anyone to see in the future. So that's an interesting thing too. Hate crime, I'm gonna spend just a minute on that. Hate crime happens to be my area of expertise. It's, I've been researching it for about 30 years now and wrote a book on it. So I know a lot about it. Um, and if you have diverse characters, there's, you may end up with some hate crimes. Um, some of the things you need to know is that the, law, the hate crime laws are new. The first ones were enacted around 1980. And so they vary from place to place and they've, they're changing. Um, about half the states, that have hate crime laws don't include crimes based on sexual orientation. And I could go on at great length about why that is and the effects of that. But the, the upshot is if somebody beats somebody up because they're gay in about half the states, that's not a hate crime. Um, and even fewer states protect gender and gender identity. So that's important. It's also important to know that hate crimes are severely underreported, it's estimated probably about five to 15% of hate crimes get reported to the police. Um, so most of them, we don't know what's going on and prosecutions and convictions are really rare. California reports in an average year somewhere between about 1500 and 2000 hate crimes and gets fewer than hundred convictions. Um, and that's because you have to prove the offender's motive which is really hard to do. Um, so, also, if you're dealing with hate crime, make sure you know the difference between hate crime and hate speech. Calling somebody a name, while certainly offensive and potentially harmful, isn't a crime. Um, but punching someone because of who they are, that is. So that's an important distinction. And one other thing um, I see people get 
wrong a lot is they assume that somebody's committing a hate crime. They must be, you know, a clan member or skinhead or something like that. And in fact, the vast majority of people who commit hate crimes don't belong to any organized groups. They're usually um, young people with their friends um, and sort of on the spur of the moment. So that's uh, about codes. And by the way, I think I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm sure and save some time for questions at the end. So let's just kind of do them all at the end and do it that way. And we'll come back to any of those. So, but moving on, we'll talk about law enforcement a little bit. Um, one thing people get wrong a lot has to do with science. I mean, everybody wants to include science in, the, in their stuff. You know, like I said, it's, it, we call it the CSI effect. Um, but science actually doesn't have as big of an of a impact in criminal justice as we might think. Um, for one thing, most crimes just don't have a lot of scientific evidence. You know, somebody walks into, um, or the scientific evidence they have might be not very useful. When I was in uh, college, I was working at a deli and I was the only person there one Saturday when a guy came in and robbed me at, at gunpoint. And, and then he left and the police came and they started dusting for fingerprints because he had touched the counter. So, you know, there was some scientific evidence, I guess there might have been fingerprints, but think about how many people had touched that counter. I mean, I hadn't wiped it down in between, this is long before COVID, I hadn't wiped it down in between customers. So think about how many fingerprints were there and what the chances were that they were going to realistically be able to, to, to get his fingerprints apart from everybody. I mean, it, it, they never caught him. So a lot of crimes have little or no scientific evidence. And even when they do, it's not like TV where, you know, they just run off to the lab and five seconds later, these very attractive people in nice clothes have results. Um, in reality, it can take months or even years. And this has been a real issue um, in cases with sexual assaults because some of that, those are backed up for years. Um, and science makes mistakes. There have been plenty of cases where people have been convicted on what turned out to be bad science or the people who were doing the testing did it poorly or made other kinds of mistakes. Lying. <laughs> uh, for some reason, there's this idea that cops can't lie. Cops can lie. I mean, of course they do lie, but also they can lie legally about lots of, can you imagine if they couldn't? It would be really hard to, you know. And one of the things that people believe is that if you ask a cop whether she's a cop, she has to be honest, and she can't lie and tell you she's not. That's not true. Um, you know, there would never be any under, uh, undercover anything if that was true. So they can lie about that. Um, they, one technique very frequently used in interrogating suspects is to put them in different rooms and tell each of them that the other one's rat in the mouth um, and, and to lie. And that has that's very effective in getting confessions and that's perfectly valid. So cops can lie. This one I'm including just because, well, for one thing, people get mistaken, but also I had this long go round with one of my editors on this. Um, what they're called, if somebody is missing, it's called a missing persons report. I know that grammatically that's awkward. I don't know why they call them that. It probably goes back to like England 500 years ago or something, but that's the that's the technical word for his missing persons reports with and his persons not people or not person and there's no apostrophe it's missing persons reports, and but the the more important thing I guess is that you don't have to wait 24 hours to file a report. Somebody can file a report immediately when somebody goes missing. And that's especially true if the person is at risk, if they're a child, um, if they have dementia, if there's other reasons to believe they're at risk, police can act right away. This is another one people um, get wrong, Miranda rights. Uh, the, the, back in 1967, I think it was, the Supreme Court held that when someone is being um, interrogated by police, they have to be told their rights first. And that, that case was, was Miranda. Um, the wording doesn't have to be exact. So they, they, they don't have to say it word for word. Although in practice, most agencies, the police carry a little card that they can read off of. So, cause they wanna make sure they get it right. Um, but what's, what's most important here is that people don't have to be Mirandized every time a police officer talks to them. It only applies to custodial interrogation. So if a police officer walks up to you on the street and says, hey, you know, I have some questions for you they don't have to Mirandize you. If they knock on your door, you're at home, they knock on your door and wanna to talk to you, they don't have to Mirandize you. If you're in custody, but they're not interrogating you, they don't have to. I actually have a story about this a bunch of years ago. 
one of my husband's friends got arrested at a football game, I think it was in Oakland, because he was drunk and obnoxious. Um, and they put him in the, the drunk tank at the Alameda County Jail overnight. And my husband, who fortunately for our marriage and my sanity was not drunk and obnoxious and did not get arrested, had taken his friend's home, stuff home with him. And uh, the next morning, the friend gets out of jail and he comes over to our house to pick up his stuff. And he was really mad because they didn't, they didn't Mirandize him. And I said, well, but did they interrogate you? I mean, what are they gonna interrogate him? They just wanted him to dry out. And he said, well, no, I said, well, then they don't have to Mirandize you. They only have to do it prior to interrogation. And probably the last thing they wanted to do was talk to a drunk guy anyway. So, um, so only has to be, people only have to be Mirandized before custodial interrogation. Suspects can waive their Miranda rights and most do. Something, I've seen percentages, something like 90% of people waive their Miranda rights. They think they can talk their way out of jail, which they can't. Um, and even uh, juveniles can waive their Miranda rights and can be interrogated without a parent present, which is controversial, but is nonetheless the law. Warrants are another issue. We've got two kinds of warrants in the United States, arrest warrants and search warrants. Um, in, in reality, we very rarely need an arrest warrant in order to arrest someone. There's a few exceptions. Um, and there are lots of exceptions also to the search warrant. Usually if you wanna search somebody's property, you need a search warrant, but especially because of the war on drugs, the, um, the Supreme Court has come up with a wide variety of exceptions to when police can, can search without a warrant. Um, and one of those exceptions that's particularly important is the, what's called the vehicle exception. Police almost never need a warrant to search a vehicle or anything in it. Um, and that's interesting because if I'm walking down the street carrying a backpack, police need a warrant to search that backpack. But as soon as I put that backpack in my car, suddenly they don't need a warrant anymore, which is weird, but that's the, with the law. They still need probable cause, so they just can't do it randomly. Um, but that's police often take advantage of this and it can be an interesting plot point. You can also play around with the concept of what's a vehicle. Um, you know, is a, a, a is an RV a vehicle? Is a spaceship a vehicle? You know, the, so you could play with that kind of stuff and have some fun with it if you want to. Um, another kind of thing you can have fun with is if police are chasing after one bad guy, and in the and they have the legal right to be doing that, and in the process they happen to stumble across another bad guy yay, they can make another arrest. So the, an example of this that I was told was a case where a guy had just committed an armed robbery and police were chasing him. So, which they can do because it's, they're in hot pursuit of a fleeing felon. So they're chasing this guy and he runs into a house. He doesn't live there. He doesn't even know the people who live there. He just chose the first house he got to. The front door was open. He runs through the house, police come after them. And as police are running through the house, you know, the bad guy has meanwhile has gone out the back door through the yard over the fence and he's gone but police are chasing him through this house and the people who live in the house are sitting in their living room bagging up dope and the police never did catch the original bad guy but they kind of came to a screeching halt there in the living room and arrested the people who were in their living room um, bagging drugs um, i guess the moral of the story is lock your door if you're going to be doing that kind of thing but that was a perfect they didn't need a warrant because they were in pursuit of a fleeing felon and it was just bad luck that you know these people <laughs> happened to have a bad guy run through the living room um, another thing that comes up often is police, even if they don't have any other kinds of authority to conduct a search, they can always ask. Um, and that's called a consent search. And unlike with Miranda rights, they don't have to tell people that they have the right to refuse. So you see this pretty frequently. Police will pull somebody over for something like speeding or you know, failure to signal a lane change or something like that. And they'll say to the person, hey, you don't mind if I take a look in your trunk, do you? And legally that person has the right to, right to refuse, but police don't have to tell them that. And so frequently people will say, yeah, cause there's a cop with a gun standing there and then they find drugs or whatever. Deadly force obviously is a really important issue right now that we could spend a lot of time on, but just a couple of points. Um, the rule is that police are allowed to use deadly force if they reasonably think it's necessary. 
And that reasonably is the, is the kicking point there because they can be mistaken about it. So what often happens is police will say, well, I thought he was going for a gun. And as long as the police were reasonable in thinking that, even if they were mistaken, it's okay. Um, and that causes all sorts of issues. Um, another issue that comes up is, you know, we talk about different kinds of force. There's lethal force is things obviously like, like shooting someone, but there's also, also non-lethal force, which can occasionally kill people. And we've seen that very recently, how something people in the, in the um, George Floyd case, who wouldn't have thought of that normally as lethal force, force but they killed him. Um, pepper spray has killed people. I know of two cases locally in which police tased someone and the person's clothing caught on fire. Um, fortunately, in both instances, the person that was able to get the clothing off and they survived. But, you know, taser, we don't think of that as lethal, but even that can be occasionally. Constitutional rights. Um, the thing people get wrong the most with this has to do with when they apply. The Constitution only limits what the government does. So by government, we mean police officers, prison officials, courts, um, and anyone else working for the government. So I work, I work for a state university, so I'm a government agent when I'm doing my job. But what it doesn't do is restrict the activities of private people. So if a private company wants to do something or a private detective wants to do something, the constitution doesn't limit them. Other, other laws might limit them, but not, not the constitution. So that's a, that can be a fun plot point. You know, who is your who is your person? Are they a private detective? They, in some ways, can get away with doing some, some more things than police can. Death investigations. Those come just because we like to kill people off in our stories. These come up frequently, and people again often get things wrong. And this varies a lot. Um, one is the terminology. The, a coroner in most in most jurisdictions is a is a police officer. Um, they're not someone with medical training. In, in California, for example, most coroners um, are the sheriff. So the sheriff has a dual title as coroner and sheriff. And I mean, our sheriff doesn't have any medical training whatsoever, but the coroner's job is to investigate any kind of suspicious or unaccompanied death. Um, somebody who works for the coroner who actually does the autopsies and, and has medical training is the medical examiner. By the way, if any of you are looking for another career, there's a big demand for medical examiners and they get paid really, really well. In my county, the medical examiner is the, the, best, is the best paid county employee. So if you have to go to med school, <laughs> you know, small detail there. Um, and for some reason, it's not a very popular job option for people who go, I would think, you know, at least nobody's gonna sue you for malpractice. Um, but, they they get paid very well, but anyway, they are that they're the person who conducts the autopsies usually with with the help of assistants. They um, usually specialize in forensic pathology, so they've done some specialized coursework on this kind of stuff, and their job is to determine cause of death. Cause of death means what killed this person. There's a distinction between cause of death and manner of death. Manner of death is why did they die? You know, was it an accident? Was it a homicide? Was it suicide? Was it an act of war or something like that? Um, the medical examiner does not determine that, but what they do figure out is cause it. What is what what is the physical thing that caused this person to die? Was it blunt force trauma? Was it lack of oxygen? So, for example, I um, I watched an autopsy a couple of years ago, um, and the the guy had been hit by a train. He'd been riding his bicycle across the train tracks with headphones on and a freight train came by at 40 miles an hour and hit him, which is pretty fatal. And so the cause of death in that case was blunt force trauma. A freight train going 40 miles an hour is a lot of blunt force. So the cause of death was, was blunt force trauma. And that was pretty easy to figure out. Even I could see that. But the question was manner of death. Was it suicide? Did he intentionally ride his bicycle in front of the train? Was it an accident because he wasn't paying attention, didn't hear it coming, had his head, his earphones on? That wasn't something for the medical examiner to figure out. That's something the cops are going to investigate. This particular guy had a troubled history. He'd recently been paroled. He had a lot going on in his life. So maybe, and I, I don't know what they finally decided. Um, so cause of death and manner of death, two different things. Um, they'll often call, call in forensic specialists if they have 
specialized uh, information they need. Um, so a forensic entomologist, for example, looks at bugs. The most accurate way of determining time of death is bugs, um, which is really gross, but really cool. Um, odontology is, is teeth marks. Um, forensic anthropology, they look at bones. Um, and so they'll bring them in. And I, I have a a friend who's a forensic anthropologist and she gets called periodically. She had one case where somebody found a skeletal hand in their backyard. So the sheriff's office called her and it turns out it was a, actually a bear paw. And to those of us who aren't anthropologists, it turns out a bear paw looks a whole lot like a human hand. Um, so that's when you need an expert to come in and say, you know, that, that we don't know how the bear paw got there, but at least it's probably not the sheriff's problem. Um, and usually it's the police department, not the coroner that collects other evidence at the scene. Also, I know you have seen all these movies where they put Vicks under their nose because of the smell. And by the way, the smell is, it's probably one of the worst smells is, is uh, decomposing human humans, uh, but they don't use Vicks. The, the, our, my local uh, assistant coroner said it just smells like mentholated death. Um, they just get used to it. Or if it's really bad, they put on masks and a tea bag inside the mask. Um, and they also don't use toe tags in many jurisdictions because they fall off relatively easily. In my jurisdiction, they, they put them on wrists. Um, pressing charges. This is another thing everybody gets wrong. Uh, victims don't um, get to decide whether to press charges in the United States. It's up to the prosecutor. And prosecutors have pretty much um, unlimited discretion on this. So, you know, a victim can decide whether to report and they can decide how cooperative they're going to be. But the decision about whether to file, file charges is going to be up to the prosecutor. So it's not unusual for the prosecutor to decline to file charges, even though the victim really wants them to or conversely to file charges even if the victim doesn't want them, which can be a good source of, of conflict in a story. Um, fragmentation is another issue with law enforcement because depending on where an offense takes place, you may end up with multiple law enforcement agencies involved. So I like, you know, if I, uh, where I live actually, because I live within a mile of my campus, which has its own police, there are potentially probably about a dozen different law enforcement agencies that could have jurisdiction over a crime that occurred in front of my house. Um, and so that can be an issue. I know you've probably seen movies where the local cops hate the feds. Usually that's not the truth. Usually they get along pretty well. In fact, sometimes the local cops are all too happy to hand it over and let the feds deal with it. Um, but sometimes there, there can be some conflict. Um, this one is I want somebody to write this so bad. I've been I've been asking people to use this as a as a plot bunny because it's so great. Um, smaller towns often will contract with larger with larger towns for things like homicide investigations. If you're a really small town, you won't have uh, you're not going to have a, a murder squad, and you're not going to have um, people with much experience in in investigating homicide. So if one happens you may have a contract with a nearby big city and, and they'll come in with their detectives, their specialized detectives. So I think that's a great plot point because you know, you've know you got your small town cops and the big city cop comes in to investigate and think of all the fun things. And I can think about this with spec fic too. What if you've got you know your backwater planet and something horrible happens and they don't have anybody who so you know they bring in the, the big shot cop from the big exciting planet who comes in and I, I think that could be fun. Um, courts. Um, first of all, there are only three possible things somebody can plea in an American court. Guilty, not guilty, or no contest. We don't have an innocent plea. We don't care if people are innocent. We just care whether they're guilty or not. Guilty means I'm admitting to every element of the crime. Not guilty means I am claiming that there is not enough evidence to prove every element of the crime. And a no contest, we don't see it very often. Um, but this is where someone is admitting that there's enough evidence to convict them, but they don't want to admit to their guilt because they're afraid of um, civil responsibility. So they're afraid, it, uh, usually a conviction can be used as evidence in a lawsuit, and they don't want that to happen for some reason. So by, by pleading no contest, they're still going to go to jail or get whatever the punishment is there, but it can't be used as evidence when they're sued. 
Plea bargaining is really important and the source of a lot of real life drama because only about 5% of arrests in the United States end up in trial. Most cases get plea bargained out um, for a variety of reasons and it's controversial too. Um, and that decision on whether to accept a plea bargain can be really difficult from the point of view of a, of a defendant, especially, in, you can imagine if you have an innocent defendant facing hard time and their, their defense attorney tells them, look, I've been offered a deal. You can go to you can go to trial, but if you get convicted at trial, you you know you're looking at forty years, or you can accept a plea to this lesser charge and you'll do five and be out. You know what would you do if you were innocent? So that's a really good source of potential lot conflict. Um, accomplice liability. There's two kinds of two kinds of people who can get involved during a crime. There's the people who assist before or during the crime. They're called accomplices. Usually they get the same punishment as the person who actually commits them. And then there's people who, who help afterwards, you know, so they might help destroy evidence or they might give the cops a false alibi or something like that. Um, they're called accessories after the fact. They don't get punished as much. Insanity defense, a, a few things here. One thing is that I beg of you to not fall into the trap of having the crazy killer. Um, people with mental illness are no more dangerous than anybody else. And I think it's a really destructive plot device to always have crazy offenders. In fact, um, people with mental illness are at greater risk for being victims. Than they, um, so that's, a, that's, a, that's important. The insanity defense is very rarely used for a variety of reasons. When it's used, it's rarely successful. And the example I always like to give of this is Jeffrey Dahmer, um, who attended, uh, attempted to use the insanity defense. You know, he killed multiple people, ate his victims, had sex with dead bodies. I mean, that sounds pretty crazy. And yet he was not successful with his insanity defense. Um, standards for insanity vary from place to place. And they're different from psychological definitions, which means somebody can be, have a diagnosis of a mental illness, but not be insane. And it's also possible for somebody to not have a diagnosis, but be found insane because the law and psychology don't always talk to each other very well. There are a few states that don't have an insanity defense. Um, and people who are successful with the insanity defense will generally not just go free. Um, generally what happens to them is they end up locked up in a mental institution until they're considered to be no longer a danger. Um, Hinckley, who shot Ronald Reagan and a couple of other people was just recently released from a mental, he was found not guilty by reason of insanity. He was just recently like last year, I think, released from um, a mental institution, but still with some pretty close supervision. So he's been locked up since the seventies. Um, so that tells you how long that could potentially be. Double jeopardy, it says you can't try somebody twice for the same crime but there's some interesting stuff about that. Sometimes it's kind of fuzzy. There's a great movie about this. I, uh, um, in, in, in this particular, you can, you can watch the movie. Um, it, Double Jeopardy doesn't stop different states from prosecuting someone. So if I kidnap someone in California and drag them over the border into Oregon, both California and Oregon can prosecute me. And actually so can the federal government because kidnapping is a federal crime. Um, so I could, potentially be convicted three times by three different jurisdictions. Um, that right attaches, it starts to come into play as soon as the jury is sworn in a trial. Um, there are some exceptions to that. But one of the most important things about this is it means in the United States, once somebody is found <coughs> not guilty, they can, and this is one of the few absolutes, they can never, ever, 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 ever be retried again for that specific offense. Even if God himself comes down from on high and says, he did it, too bad. Um, there, in many countries, if good evidence is, um, is found after the acquittal, the person can be retried, but not in the United States. So three seconds after the jury says not guilty, if that person stands up in court and says, ha ha suckers, I did it, they can't be retried. If they lied on the, on the stand, they could be tried for perjury or something. Um, but that is an absolute rule. There are only two verdicts in the United States, guilty and not guilty. We don't find people innocent. We either find them guilty, which means that we find the prosecutors proven, proved every element 
beyond a reasonable doubt or not guilty, which means the prosecutors failed to prove at least one element beyond a reasonable doubt. And corrections. Um, jails versus prisons, people use these terms interchangeably all the time, but they're actually very different things. Jails are usually run locally and they, they house two, two groups of people. They house people who are waiting for their trial and either weren't granted bail or didn't have the money for bail. And they also house people who are, have been convicted of misdemeanors of relatively minor crimes and are serving short, short times. Which is interesting because that means you've got, say, people accused of murder locked up in the same facility as people accused of convicted of very minor crimes. These are some, I like these pictures. I, I, other people, you know, they go on vacation and take pictures of sunsets and stuff like that. I take pictures of jails and prisons. So the upper, the two on the your, right hand your, are both, oh, I'm sorry, your, what? Your PowerPoint is no longer showing. Oh no. Has everybody lost it? Can you give me a thumbs up or something if you can see it? Okay. So it looks like other people are, are seeing it. Angel, can you help out with that? Let me try stopping the share and restarting it and see if that works <laughs> for lack of, of better. <laughs> Let's see. There we go. Did that help? Can everybody see it okay? Okay. Yes, good. thank you. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows what the internet gods are up to today. Um, so the pictures you see there on the right are both gold rush era jails in California. The one on the bottom right, there was an earthquake at some point afterwards and it, it fell apart. Um, but you can see these, are, those are not facilities people are supposed to be in for very long. The upper right one makes me wince every time I see it because that's in a really hot part of California. Um, and you can, can you imagine what that would be like in August? Um, the, the, the jail on the left is in Monterey. Um, and it, it was, um, so these were facilities were meant, that were meant and still are meant for short term, as opposed to um, prisons. Prisons are usually run by um, state or federal agencies, or unfortunately, in some places, private corporations, and they're housing people who are serving long periods, who've been convicted of felonies, and the security level can vary a lot. I've been to minimum security prisons that look like college campuses and you could just walk away if you wanted to. Um, and I've, I've been to, I've never been to a super max prison. I have been to a maximum security prison where there's lots of big heavy locked doors and that kind of thing. So it varies. That's my, my kids when they were little, that's Alcatraz. <laughs> My, my younger daughter there was totally fascinated with Al Capone. Um, she's turned out okay. Anyway. And, and that, that prison you see there on the left is uh, Pelican Bay, which is California's most secure prison facility. It looks like a, a factory or something like that, but the, these, are, these are facilities to hold people long-term. People also get probation and parole mixed up because they both begin with P and involve <laughs> releases. Probation is with, is, um, when someone is released instead of going, being locked up. So usually it's for something relatively minor and they're told, okay, instead of sending you to jail, we're gonna put you on probation. You have to obey certain conditions. And as long as you obey those conditions, you don't have to go to jail. Parole is when somebody has already served some time and we let them out early for good behavior. Um, conjugal visits. Um, you might, we might like to include them in our stories, but in reality, they're very rarely allowed. And I know everybody likes to sort of focus on the sexual aspect, but in fact, the purpose is to um, encourage family reunification because we know that inmates who maintain family ties are less likely to um, recidivate. So, um, but very few states allow them and very few inmates are eligible. Um, Two states, California, California and New York, do explicitly allow conjugal visits from same-sex partners. Um, the other states don't, but they would have to at this point if the people, at least if the people were married. Um, and they have to have had the relationship prior to incarceration. So you can't you know, have your pen pal come, come during your conjugal visits. 
remember to check your jurisdictions, rules, and policies. And I'm going to end with pimping my, with my uh, criminal justice stuff. I'm co-author. Actually, we've got a fourth edition with a new cover. I'm co-author of um, of an intro to criminal justice text. So if you want sort of a broad overview of the criminal justice system, you can look at that or another intro text. If you're interested in hate crimes, that's my book on the right. And I have a website called Book Justice where um, it's been kind of dormant for a while, but I, I post questions and stuff about, um, about criminal justice. And then finally, this is my contact information. So you can get a hold of me any of these ways. And I'd like to um, open it up to questions or comments. So maybe the easiest way to do this, let me start. And, and again, I know I just went through that really fast. Um, but um, I will be happy to send you the entire thing if you email me. So um, if you have a question, maybe type it in the chat and I will try and address it. Or you can ask since somebody's talking. <laughs> Just make sure you unmute yourself. What are the things that, if you don't have a specific question, maybe what are the things that you struggle the most with or, or have to deal with it the most when you're when you're writing criminal justice stuff. You guys are like my students, you're very quiet. I can't grade you on participation points or anything. So I'll ask you a more specific question. What what are you working on something now that includes criminal um, yes, yeah, so I can put my contact information up again. Yeah, sorry, I went through that really fast. Hey, could I ask a question? Yeah, please do. Do you have a reference that is a good reference on court procedure? So if we want to double check when we're writing something that we've got the court procedure exactly right um, in say uh, federal courts or certain state courts or anything else like that, is there a good way of doing that? There is, can you email me and I'll send you some links. It's probably the easiest okay. way to do that. There's a couple of textbooks out there, and then there's just some websites that are really helpful. So, so email and me. And also, your email is Kim, Kim at Kim, Kim, at Kim at kfieldingrights.com. Yeah. Do we have other questions? I, I know I talk really fast. So I'm sorry. My students complain about that too. What are you guys working on? You're just thinking for the future? Um, I'm actually working on a, a novel that's uh, uh, urban fantasy, but it's kind of like a supernatural meets in CIS. Oh, fun. So like a crime investigation team who's a group of paranormals who are investigating paranormal crimes. Oh, that's fun. So... <laughs> Yeah, so and I don't know helpful. much about I don't know much about procedural stuff. I'm more sci-fi fantasy person. So this was a really nice chance to check in and get a good start on what I need to start looking for. <laughs> That's great. I have a series, I think it's possibly my favorite series to write. It's called The Bureau. And it's like it's about this agency that's like the FBI, but it's the Bureau of Trans Species Affairs. So they've got jurisdiction over like vampires and stuff like that. And 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 I have um, each book takes place in a different time period. So I get to do a lot of really nerdy research on that, which is really fun. But um, and I've got all sorts of monsters involved. But I do base it, you know, and it's very noir because I I personally love noir. So you have this kind of noir detective paranormal thing going. But but it is based, you know. The actions are based on what's really legal. So that's at least, you know, even if there's vampires, there's some reality in there. And I think, I honestly think that's really helpful for readers. It really helps readers connect to a story if it doesn't feel too disconnected from, from reality, which doesn't mean you can't play with stuff. Of course you can, but I mean, you've got vampires, you know. <laughs> Do we have okay, I've got another question to throw at you. Um, sure met plenty of lawyers but insight into different characters is there um a stereotypical character that you would have for any of the other um i i met cops i've met lawyers but for any of the other cast of characters involved in criminal justice are there any sort of stereotypes where you're going to tell me 
never or always for uh, drawing uh, writing a particular character? I guess I, I guess with stereotypes, it's always never. But you know, there are some. You know, when you're talking about people in corrections, we often see people like prison guards um, shown as not being very educated, and that's actually fairly accurate. Um, um, it's changing a little bit, but still to this day, most prison guards have high school diplomas. Um, so, so, and often prisons are kind of like the local, the local job maker. So people who, who become prison guards, it's because it's a, a good paying job in their, in their area. It's not something that they necessarily wanted as a career or love or have any particular aptitude for. So that, that's, that can be a fairly realistic. That's changing a little bit, but it's still the case in a lot of in a lot of locations. What's the training for that? What do you have to go through? Very little, and it it, it just de it depends from on the jurisdiction. Like for um, some of those private prisons, basically have no training at all. You get more training to work at McDonald's, which is why the private prisons are awful. <laughs> well, that's one of the reasons why the private prisons are awful. So that's a stereotype you can definitely play with is the, the poorly trained. There's a lot of problems with corruption, of, of mistreatment of inmates, of, um, of sexual relationships with inmates, that kind of thing. So that's, that's, that's realistic. Um, How do you, I mean, I see that a lot on uh, various TV shows on sexual relationship with inmates. How is a, a one guard ever left alone for long enough for this? They find ways. Um, the you know the it depends on the on the facility but when people are in are spending most of their time or all of their time in in a facility they find all sorts of creative ways to get around the rules and um often the rules are not particularly good at protecting and even if other and other guards may know what's going on and purposely turn their backs so there's no cameras or anything else on uh, on these guards or? in many cases no huh yeah we, we, there's not there is not good accountability in corrections. And that's changing a little bit. You know, it's what it's an interesting thing you, we can play with in SpecFic is the use of technology, but technology is has come into play a lot more in law enforcement than in corrections. So in uh, Orange is the New Black, uh, there was a plot point where one of the um, guards, uh, it was hushed up that they had actually slept with an inmate and made them pregnant. Um, what is, if it's discovered that a guard had sexual relationships with an inmate, is that always illegal? Is it possible to cover that up? Is it, uh, it's, it's always illegal, but they, it does get covered up. I mean, obviously if you have an inmate who was incarcerated at the time she got pregnant, somebody did that. And that's the only okay. males she has access to are guards. Well, there's your answer, but you know, is she willing to, to, to say who it was, um, you know, you can't necessarily force a DNA test. So it's, it, it, hap it happens with, I mean, nobody keeps track of these things very well, um, but it, it happens. Another stereotype that's fairly accurate is with judges. Um, judges, there are still a lot more male judges than there are women judges. They still tend to be older and of uh, fairly affluent. I have a, a character, a juvenile who commits an assault while he's having a flashback. Uh, is, is that something that is likely to be prosecuted or not? Yeah, yeah, it is. So he's having a, he's, is he a PTSD or something like that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's probably, you know, it's, it depends on the case. It depends on the prosecutor, but, um, in general, law enforcement and prosecutors are, are often not very sensitive to mental health issues and how, you know, how hard they are on juvenile offenders can really vary. I, you know, the guy who was in charge in my county of, ju of juvenile offenses had a, a relative, this was several years back, he was relatively focused on rehabilitation, but his counterpart, one county over, what he, the, he would go for the hardest thing he could do. If he could ch charge them as an adult, he would. And so that was a very different philosophy in two different jurisdictions that were right next to each other. What is a, uh, the responsibility of a prison system legally to avoid being sued for safety of inmates? 
So if, um, if an inmate, for example, was raped, is there, um, by under what grounds would they be able to sue the prison system for not maintaining safe conditions? The most common way they're sued is under a federal law. It's, it's uh, section 1983, 42 USC section 1983. Um, and that's a federal law that allows people to sue those who are acting under color of state law. So any state agency um, that violates their constitutional rights. So if a, if a um, prison is unsafe, that's a violation of your eighth amendment rights. And so, so prisoners will use that. Um, by the way, that's the same provision people will use to sue, sue police officers for constitutional right violations. So the 1983 is used a lot. It's also sometimes abused. People will, you know, people are sitting in prison, they've got nothing better to do, why not file a lawsuit? Um, but that's, that's, the most, um, that's the most common way for people to sue. And it's, it can be, everybody knows, for example, that there's a huge problem with sexual assault in prisons and very little is done about it. It can be difficult for inmates to have access. You don't, you don't automatically get access to legal assistance in a section 1983 case. So they often have to do their own cases or rely on another prisoner to help them out. And, you know, if you're barely literate, you know, how are you gonna sue? Do we have, we're almost out of time. Do we have other comments or questions? So I've seen as a plot point many times in TV programs that uh, they use their right to an education to become lawyers. In every state, are you allowed to uh, go for the bar after you've just been let out of jail and you're a former felon? No, <laughs> no. You, every state re requires that inmates be allowed access to legal materials, um, but a lot of states in order to take the bar exam, you have to be a graduate from an accredited law school. Um, so that just depends on the state. California, you do not do not have to graduate from an accredited law school in order to take the bar exam if you can pass it, good for you. But I'm, I'm a member of the bar in Nebraska and in Nebraska, you do have to graduate from an accredited law school to take the bar. So that, that's good. that varies. But it is not uncommon for, for inmates to become jailhouse lawyers and informally help each other out. So um, the, the, I guess the old term is correspondence courses. There's a, there, are there any states where you could do that and then actually have these plot points be valid that they became a lawyer? Um, only the states that, that don't require you to go to an accredited law school, so like California. Okay. Yeah. yeah, some states. The American Bar Association accredits law schools. In some states, you have to go to an ABA accredited law school. Others, you can get your education in a variety of different ways. Uh -huh. And there's a there's a whole issue about that. About should you know should we be limiting who gets to be lawyers? There's also in many in most states. Um, to become a lawyer, you have to do more than pass the bar exam. They do a background check and stuff. And so there have been cases where people have been denied entrance to the bar because of things in their background. Now, usually just an ordinary criminal conviction is not going to do it. But there was a, a, a white supremacist in Illinois who um, had was very active in white supremacy. And he was denied. He, he went to a, a, a law school and graduated, passed the bar exam, but they denied him access to the bar because of his activity with white supremacy. He ended up going to prison for threatening um, a federal judge. Other questions? I think we're out of time. If you come up with questions or again, you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint, by all means, please, please email me. Thank you so much for, for joining me today. I hope this was useful. I like talking about it. So I, I hope I didn't talk too fast and I hope you, you like listening to it. So thanks so much. And I'm looking forward to seeing you guys at some of the other con events. Thanks you guys.